This is Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. I'm Kevin Savitz. Jim Schuyler was founder of DesignWare. Founded in 1980, DesignWare created educational software that was published by other companies, including SRA, Xerox, and Spinnaker, as well as software that it published under its own label. DesignWare's titles included Creature Creator, Grammar Examiner, Mission Algebra, Spellicopter, and Trapezoid, among other titles. Jim programmed Story Machine himself, which was published by Spinnaker Software. DesignWare was acquired by Peachtree in 1984. In preparation for this interview, Jim wrote a seven-part article on his blog about DesignWare's prehistory, story, and legacy. It's well worth checking out. You'll find that link in the show notes at ataripodcast.com. This interview took place on September 11, 2017. In it, we discuss Peter Rosenthal, David Cease, and Bill Bowman, all of whom I have previously interviewed. You'll find those links in the show notes as well. The, the prelude is there are two things that I really have been very, very interested in my entire life. The primary one is computers. And I got into computers for the same reasons that I think it was Alan Kay described um, I can't find this quote anywhere online, but I think once Alan described the computer as the ultimately tractable medium. And um, so com- computers have always been the base of operations from which I've done many other things like medicine and education and uh, kind of verging on artificial, artificial intelligence, uh, expert systems, those kinds of things. The second thing is I've always had an interest in communications. So the interest in communications has led me to working with computer languages, a little bit with human language and with natural language recognition um, and creation of of output from computers in in natural language and really human computer and vice versa kinds of interactions have been the things I was interested in. So So the prelude is when I was, unlike many people today, I got my first computer when I was 16. And my first computer was an IBM 709. I was part of a high school program called the National High School Institutes at Northwestern University, summer of 63, when just incidentally, there was some kind of a partial solar eclipse. It was the first time I'd ever seen a solar eclipse. It was partial. uh, And you could see all the little crescents of the sun filtering through the leaves onto the ground. Um, At this institute, which ran several weeks at Northwestern, Uh, One of the recurring courses that we took part in, so we went kind of like at college level and we're just participating in courses, learning about engineering. One of the courses allowed us to punch cards in the old Hollerith card days and write programs in Fortran. I was absolutely sucked in, like incredibly sucked into it. There are two ways I could have gone career-wise. One was I could have become a classical pianist. As my teacher said, you're either going to be a great, a, a really excellent amateur or you're going to be a struggling professional. And I decided I didn't want to be a struggling professional because I was excellent at computing. So I got into computers. Uh, went, I got all three of my degrees at Northwestern. I have one of the first PhDs in computer science there. Uh, among the other, I was going to say among the other luminaries, not that I'm a luminary, uh, but um, slightly earlier than mine was Jacques Vallée. Uh, you know, Jacques is a, a very interesting guy who was uh, the base for the French-speaking guy in uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. So um, got my PhD there and got into interactions between the computer and humans because my responsibility at the computing center in a half-time job was for the dial-in ports on the computer. So I had access to the computer along with a whole bunch of people at night. At midnight, the computing center would run these very long jobs that couldn't run during the day, that just needed long swaths of one hour, two hours, three hours, pulling tapes through and and, and massaging large amounts of data. So after midnight, several people, including myself, were given the run of the computing center after those jobs finished. So we had this supercomputer, which at the time was a control data 6400. We had this supercomputer from midnight until six at the absolute latest, 6 a.m., which was when the engineers came in to test the machine, check for burned out transistors, um, and and make sure it would run for the day for the production jobs. So sometimes all the jobs would bomb out and terminate abnormally within 10 minutes. And so from 12.15 on, we had this supercomputer available. And in those days, you submitted jobs in batches. 
But because there were just a few of us there who were privileged to do this, it's just an informal arrangement uh, set up by the head of the computing center, Ben Mittman, who is also famous for uh, uh, promoting computer chess. So we'd have the machine from 12.15 until 6, or sometimes we'd be there at 6 and the machine would still be cranking away. <laughs> and they would have to checkpoint the job off onto a tape so they could start it the next night. Um, during that time, Chess 1.0 was written by Keith Gorl and Larry Atkin and Dave mm -hmm. Slate. And uh, so that was the crew that I was hanging out with uh, very late at night. And on occasion, my jobs would fail in catastrophic ways that would then terminate the running of chess. They used to have chess playing itself. They'd have two jobs running, and there was some kind of random perturbations that they could insert into the algorithm. And the two jobs would play each other and alternate on the screen. So um, at Northwestern, I got into computers and teaching. And following North, Northwestern, I moved to San Francisco, where I did this in uh, medical education for a while. In those days, you'd call it computer-based learning or computer-based education, or a term I didn't really like, computer-aided instruction or computer-assisted instruction. But that's really what I was doing. The machines got smaller and smaller. So from the Control Data 6400, where my software was running on somewhere upwards of 15 different systems around the country. It may have been as many as 25 at some times. Uh, they got smaller. I had a PDP-11 in San Francisco. We had more ports. People would dial in. Nowadays, hardly anybody knows what dial-up is. Um, maybe you can locate, be fun to locate the sound of a modem when it's connecting. <laughs> sure. That whistle that it gives and then it warbles. Uh -huh. Partly because that was what was going on in the Atari machines. So the early tapes, when you would put a tape into the Atari machine, there was a tone on that tape, and it was warbling like that. So yeah. it's like, like the modem connection. Um, that was you know, a, a continuation of that kind of technology being used for storage rather than communications. So in 78 and 79, you know, the Kim one, which was the first kit computer, came out, I think, around, I think, 75. I was looking it up yesterday. It looks like 76. And... By 78 or 79, we started seeing uh, home computers, microcomputers. Now, I'm stumbling over home because Atari, I think, really addressed home. Apple, on the other hand, was very much focused on education. Yes. And I was focused on education at the time and computer-based education. So it was an absolute natural for me to get in touch with people. I tell this story, which I'll tell you now, about calling Apple. I just cold called them. I called them up on the telephone. Um, Interesting technical detail. In those days, San Francisco and San Jose and Oakland and everything were the same area code. Uh, and then they broke off 408 from, for San Jose, but it turned out that the two area codes interoperated in that the exchanges were unique in San Francisco and unique in San Jose. And I discovered this kind of like phone freaking. I discovered that you could actually dial San Jose and you didn't have to dial a 408 area code. Hmm. So the two actually interoperated kind of secretly below, huh. below the surface. I don't know who that's. Was that just to save three digits or was that, was that saving? No, seven. Yeah, okay. so, so seven digits. So the exchange, the first three digits were unique, did not overlap between sure. San Francisco and San Jose. Huh. So you could dial all around the Bay Area uh, with just seven digits, even though there were, were two different area codes. And now what do we got? We got six or seven and we've got overlays. Um, that's an aside. 78, 79. So 79, I called Apple. They said, oh, you need to talk to Steve. As we know, there were two Steves. Um, and so I went down there and Steve Jobs was in the next to the corner office. This was in the building that they called Bandley too. I think now everyone's in the spaceship. Um, but, uh, Bandley too was the building and the marketing guy was in the corner. Uh, I want to say Phil Roybal, R-O-Y-B-A-L. I think that's who was, um, doing marketing for them at the time. And actually, if, if I'm wrong about that, you may want to cut that part out of the, <laughs> the interview. Um, but Phil had several apples in his room on the corner. One was green. One was red. I don't know if they had a blue. They had a whitish one, and then they had, of course, the cream color that they settled on. And I can remember being taken into the room, and they'd show me the, they showed me the different apples in different colors and asked what I thought of them. This was a day when you'd walk in, and you'd get to talk to Steve Jobs or Phil or, or Bosniak wasn't really around there, although I met him in those days. Steve was real interested in education. But I never could convince him to fund any projects. Uh, I was with a research institute in 1979. 
So never convinced him to fund anything. But the, the funniest story is that one day he said, look, I can't fund you, but let's let's do something. We went out into the back of Bandley, too, which was a warehouse and production line. There were Apple II's rolling down a, like like a roller ramp uh, that were all boxed up. Steve reached over, pulled one out and said, here, take this, take it home. We're going to have an Applesoft basic card in a week or two. Uh, come down and get the Applesoft basic card when we got it. We may have had like a pre-production run or something. But I went home with an Apple II, serial number 2515. It has since been lost. Um, and I programmed the darn thing in hex. Mm -hmm. So they had a, you know, a screen editor kind of thing. And you could move the cursor, I think, and select the line, what you wanted to change in memory, and change the program by writing in hex. There wasn't even an assembler for the machine. So I messed around with that. They um, think they had high-res graphics in those days. It was a bitmap, of course. Uh, so you just bitmapped right out of memory. And it was just a lot of fun to work with that machine. Sometime early in that, and I'm going to guess it was 79, I did go down to Atari. And I knew several people who were working with Atari. I don't know if they were on staff. These people like Joe Schlesinger, Joe DeCure, um, Ed DeWath worked with them. Uh, it may not have been in 79. But I went down to see the guys and see what they were doing. It was clear that a lot of this was kind of my, the tech was migrating from their coin operated games business. So they call that coin op. And um, they showed me their machines. And it was, it was just interesting to see how different these were. So both the Apple and the Atari were 6502 processors. Yeah. Yet the graphics were done in very different ways. So in the Atari machines, there were these special chips. And this was just a mind blower for me because sure, I understood sort of bitmap graphics and I understood sending, let's say um, a graphics language out to a terminal because we were doing that at Northwestern experimentally. So you'd, you'd say, draw a circle and you know, it said X, Y coordinates and all of that. But of course you didn't have that with the 6502. So the Atari machines were really cool to me because they were mapping, but also you could determine the, um, the density of the mapping. Uh, you may want to, you know it a lot more, so you may want to explain what's going on there. But, I mean, you could go from what on the IBM days would be called CGI, character graphics, mm -hmm. to high-resolution bitmap. But you could do this in strips on the, on the screen. Right. So you could have a portion up above that was high-resolution and then have, gra have uh, uh, characters below, which was real economical because you didn't have to draw all the bitmaps for the characters. So that was very cool. The thing that I really liked about those Atari machines was the sprite capability. So on the Apple II, when we wanted to have, uh, let's take Spellicopter as an example. So to 81, 82, we developed Spellicopter. By 83, 84, we were selling it. With Spellicopter, you got this little helicopter that's flying around on the screen. And so you've got to be able to move thing, the thing around. Um, you'd like it to be able to go in front of things. Uh, we didn't do that in Spellicopter, but you can imagine you've got the helicopter flying along. You like to have mountains and trees and clouds and things. You want the Spellicopter to go in front of them, not chunk into them and erase them. So the Atari having built-in mechanisms for sprites was very cool. We loved that. And in fact, when we did do later products, we built a sprite mechanism of our own into our code so that we could do that on the Apple II. You know, for, I mean, for people thinking these days, the idea of a sprite is is just second nature to everybody. You think about here's a little character on the screen, sure, moving around, something moves in front of something. It doesn't destroy it; it just kind of moves in front of it. Right. So this idea that you would have like a body with transparency around it was completely new at that time. And the way you'd implement it is by taking a whole chunk that would be the body plus part of the background. You'd have bits that would indicate transparency. And you would first of all pick up what was in the display, put down the little figure with background around it, and then when you were going to move it, you would replace the figure with the background you had saved and then draw the figure over here. Mm -hmm. So we built sprite systems of our own to do that transportably. It, it seemed like, I mean, Designware, just put a pin in that just for a second, Designware created games for... Uh, the Apple II and the Atari and the uh, IBM PC Junior and I think Commodore and other other platforms. On the Atari versions, which I've been looking at, it looks like you didn't really use the capabilities of the Atari. You went the 
the, the easy way and just did direct ports. There's not a lot of colors. I don't think you actually use the Atari sprite system. You just were going for ease of porting, I think. Yes, and, and, and actually I want to react to saying that we used the easy way. I mean, we used a harder way and that we had to write all that stuff. Hmm. So it was more difficult for us to do that, but it was more portable. The easy way would have been to do it very specifically for, for the Atari computer. Um, it, there was a time, to, so, so there's a story behind that. Um, portability, universability, universality, uh, transportability, write once, run anywhere as mm -hmm. a principle, mm -hmm. yeah. is something that's been a, a mainstay of everything that I've done. So in 1975 and 76, I was working on a system called the Courseware Design System, which, which I built, promoted, um, and I wasn't just the technologist. I mean, I ran a project that did all this stuff, but, but you know, looking into all the as educational aspects. Um, and the Courseware Design System was designed to be a universal translator. So you could describe computer human interactions in what we called a canonical language. So, you know, kind of like a dictionary of, of interactive things that you could do, describe an interaction in the canonical language, and then it had a translator that could produce basic or pilot or, or I think we produced really wonko things like Fortran. We could produce programs in, in many different languages using these translation, computer language translation roles, cool. produce those and then run them anywhere. So we had programs that we wrote at Northwestern and then wrote later, um, at YCAT, when I was at YCAT in 78, 79, and then by 80, I wasn't doing the course for design system anymore. But that idea of universality, uh, at least being able to translate, is core to so many things that I did. So the base for that, in, um, and this was probably by early 1982 that this happened, was one of our programmers who fit the profile that I always look for. I look for people who are retreads. So um, people can look up retread if they don't know what that means. But but uh, I look for somebody who's got a really solid background in something, knows something and really loves to do it, and has gained some facility in computing or programming and really wants to advance into that. So I love people that have got a solid background, really smart, really quick on things, and want to go into a new field. Because I've done that repeatedly, and I've always used computer science as the base to do that. So there's this fellow, George Kaplan, who was working as a parachute rigger in the East Bay. And George um, had a background as an astronomer. I think that was his training was astronomy. And in astronomy, they used a language called Forth, uh, F-O-R-T-H, as, a, uh, as a, a telescope telescope pointer, I think they, they would tell it where they wanted to go, where they'd look up star catalogs, and then it could point the telescope at the, the field that you wanted to look at in the sky, and then, of course, could track it. And, you know, and they had mechanisms, I think, that would, that would make the telescope track it, but Forth could do all of this stuff. Forth was built on the idea that there would be a kernel that would run on many different computers and a language above that that would make use of these of the primitives of that language to again write once run anywhere and george convinced us and this was a big you know take a leap off the cliff kind of thing george convinced us that that was a really cool way to do educationals and that actually he convinced us that was a cool platform i knew that was a cool way to do stuff and the fact that that platform existed was great the difficulty was was that you had to write in reverse Polish notation. That is Polish like <laughs> the country. And um, writing in reverse Polish means, you know, if you want to add three and five, you first say three, five, add. So the operation comes after the, after the uh, right. RANs. And um, fourth was entirely built on that. But an additional cool thing was that in fourth, you could define your own primitives, your own verbs. So if you wanted something that would plop a sprite on the screen, you would develop a language element, kind of, an, kind of like an object. So an object-oriented program, you'd have an object representing the thing on the screen. You would instantiate that object, and the, you could say to the object, okay, draw yourself, or move a little to the right, or wave your hand. So you'd have these messages you could send um, to the things that the object could do. 
And fourth was like that in the sense that you could uh, create your own verb, create your objects, and define what that verb was. And you could define a verb like wave. So you could design something called wave, and then you could tell the object to wave. And it was really, really, really neat to be able to do that. So that made it very easy for us to write portable software because we were abstracting from the individual machine or from the machine level, we were abstracting to this language fourth. So was the design work stuff done in fourth? It was all in fourth. Wow. Uh, there were some things, some early things we did that were not in fourth, that were in basic. But we stopped doing that when we started. Well, we stopped doing that when we wrote Spellicopter. But Facemaker and Story Machine were really our first, you know, titles. Facemaker became one of the Spinnaker titles. Um, by the time we did the Spinnaker products, I think those mu those must have been in fourth. Wow. Because later on they were in fourth. And we continued. So look, the, the, the way the market was working in those days, you know, Atari would bring out a machine, Apple bring out a machine, Commodore did the Commodore PET. Um, you know, the, I mean, the PET was just a really weird thing compared to, I mean, the Atari and the Apple were real computers. Maybe the Atari more so. I think the Atari had a lot of technical things that were very cool. And then the Apple was, you know, there. But the PET was very specific. Um, and when they have a 2001 or something like that as well, there was a TRS-80. Sure. Which, you know, would, would make our programmers gag. We, we'd think of a game and we we're going to write the game. And, the, and, and I would say, okay, so we've got to have a TRS version, TRS-80 version of this so that we can sell it Radio Shack. And I think they would go cry. <laughs> it, it, was just, it, was, it was terrible to see uh, because the TRS-80 was very character oriented. You, you had to put things together with lots of characters. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the IBM PC was a good target. Um, so, so that's where we were. I mean, you know, it, it's it's worth mentioning that the company actually went through two incarnations. In '80, when I formed it, uh, I ramped it up by doing consulting for people in computer based education. And uh, our first big break was to sell a really large product to SRA in Chicago. SRA was an educational publisher, mostly for junior high and high school. And we sold them a book package called Computer Discovery. Uh, we acted as a corporate author, which means that we wrote all the stuff and none of us took credit for it in the book. So, you know, generally when you write a book, You've got an author's name, you might have some editor, or you might have an editor if it's a compendium of things. Sure. We didn't do any of that. This was authored by Designware. And uh, I drafted the book, I wrote a lot of the detail, but Leslie Chehovich was, was doing our um, development. We called it R&D in those days. There wasn't that much R in it, there was a lot of D. And she, she still is, she, at that time I hired her because she was so detail-oriented. And she could just keep track of all these details. And although she wasn't a programmer, the programmers loved working with her. That's one of the cool things I think. You see my hands go up here, it's like, ah, reminiscing. The, the coolest thing about Designware for me, and I think the people that work there, is not the products. So they were fine, they were kind of average to somewhere slightly above average in terms of interest for kids. But the thing that was really fun was working there. Every week we would have a brainstorming session. Uh, I know we reached a point where we had too many ideas and we kind of didn't need brainstorming anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, you can come up with an idea a lot quicker than you can implement the thing. Mm -hmm. So every week there'd be brainstorming sessions. I would say a couple times a year we would go to, oh gosh, I think Pier 39 had even been built in the design wear days in the 80s. It was just like 37 years old. So we would go to Pier 39, which is, you know, a big tourist thing here in San Francisco, to a video arcade. And we'd get pizzas. And then I, I would bring rolls of quarters. And people would just keep feeding the quarters into the machines all night and eating pizza and discussing, gee, this interaction works really well. This interaction's really tough. This level I can't get past, you know, those kinds of things thinking about how that might affect our design of these games for, for the Atari. And um, 
everyone thinks back about those things. Those are the things that made design were what it was in terms of being a, a development environment. And it was very much technology driven in the sense that the technology dictated what we could do. It was education driven and, and, and this term edutainment was new in those days. And I honestly don't know who invented it. Um, I know I spoke at any number of times when the Spinnaker guys, Dave Bowman and uh, um, Bill Bowman and Dave Seas were in our offices. We talked about edutainment software. So that term was born sometime in the very early 80s. It certainly was around by, by 1982. But that idea of taking education and entertainment and trying to glue them together or, or you know, saute them, whatever metaphor you want, was what we were trying to do. And doggone it, that was a challenge. That was a huge challenge. And the entertainment value of a lot of what we did was very questionable. I mean, it was always questionable. Look, here's this idea of Spellicopter, which was probably the, the best idea anyone had there. And on, I wish I knew who invented the, the name, but I know the name came up in one of our brainstorming sessions. You got a helicopter and you got a bunch of letters, which if you, you can randomize and throw them on the ground out in a field over here. And so you've got, got you know, you've got a word like um, uh, metaphor. <laughs> so you'd have all those letters over here and you use a joystick and you, 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 you turn on the helicopter and you lift up and you, you take off and you go past some objects in the sky. Then you arrive over here and here are all these letters. And now you got to figure out what kind of word could that possibly spell. And then you've got to beam them up into the helicopter. Mm -hmm. um, interesting concept, but you know, how long does the entertainment value last? It, it's probably somewhat short, Yeah. but we were pushing that envelope all the time, hmm. trying to figure out what work. I'll tell you one of the, one of the best things in my life was a few years ago when I was interacting with somebody by email. And the guy said, oh, my God, you were associated with designware. I, I don't know. He looked me up or something. And he said, my brother and I used to fight over who would get the computer next to play Spellicopter. <laughs> so I'm thankful to the guy. It yes. really, really helped me a lot to know that somebody liked Spellicopter enough to, to, to be combative over it. <laughs> like, rather they not be combative and pull, pull each other's hair out. Was that your big seller? Spellicopter... You know, Facemaker was up there too. Yeah, they they both were gold and platinum, and you know any any category that that you could think of there. So you guys started off as a as a uh, as as a programmers for other companies, like we talked about Spinnaker and and Reader's Digest and Xerox and SRA, right. and then and then you transitioned into being a publisher yourself. Mm -hmm. um, why that change? Because I, I read so, some articles with you saying like why it was better just to be a developer and you didn't have to advertise and it was so much better. And then, then you went and became a publisher. Well, this is an example of the grass is greener on the other side of the fence, you know, syndrome. Um, gosh, let's just say it was fame. We wanted fame. Imagine you're, you're the person writing the software. You're sitting in your office. You're working late at night even. I mean, I cannot tell you how many times, look, I'm a 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. person. I'm, I'm up way late at night. I still, I don't get up at six in the morning, but I'm up by eight, okay? So I'm a night owl and I just love the quiet time in the middle of the night when I can work on stuff and focus. And, and programming was perfect for that because the computer was awake all the time. You know, I, I didn't need to keep anyone late at the office. I could dial into the computer or I could use Apple II on my desk. Um, that was that was very cool. So when you invent something, you invent programs. And we were doing things. So this is pre-Spinnaker. Pre-Spinnaker, we were doing things for it was a company called Creative Publications that we did something for. And it was a little racetrack where you would do some educational thing and your car would go put, 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 put around the racetrack. And you could program in your own racetracks, or, or at least there were a bunch of different racetracks that you could do. That idea of components of a construction set, okay? I don't know when pinball construction set came around, but it was it may have been sometime in the 80s. All of us wanted these kinds of things where your customer could get your software and then do something with it. 
they could build something. We loved constructing, we wanted them to be able to construct. So here we are writing all these programs and we get this idea and we say, we say, parentheses, look, Skylar started this company on a $3,000 credit line credit card. So I did, I started that company, I had a credit card that had a $3,000 credit line, which in those days was like two months of salary, okay? So it wasn't piddling, it was, it was okay. And I started the company using that to, to buffer us in, but $3,000 is not gonna buy me any advertising. It's not gonna buy me a bunch of programmers. So I had to get into the business somehow. What I did was to bootstrap the company in by becoming a corporate author for companies like Creative Publications, which was nearby. Um, what else did we do? Uh, we sold a project to Reader's Digest in those days, which became a very interesting part of the story later on. But we sold the product to Reader's Digest, which also never really saw the light of day. These were projects that cost us I mean, I'll give you real figures. The Reader's Digest project cost us $140,000. That was more than the price of my house in those days. Mm -hmm. So I had a two flat in San Francisco that wasn't even a $140,000 house. Huge amount of money. Salaries in those days were twenty dollars or $30,000 a year. So what was that? Five, six, seven, seven times a programmer's salary to write one program, which was never published. What was this program? Problem Solving Skills by Reader's Digest. Um, it was a, it was beginning, it was looking at learning styles actually. So learning styles as a phrase had not become current yet. And what we were looking at was what are the different ways you could approach a math problem? So now you got me talking, Kevin. So, um, and, and I like that stuff as much as I like the technology. So for instance, let's say you're doing addition. Uh, anyone who's familiar with Montessori schools and with Cuisinaire rods, knows that one of the ways they like to teach addition is with these rods that have, each rod is a specific length. So you've got one for one unit, one for two units. I don't know what else you have. I've not worked with them since then. Yeah. And each length is a particular color as well. And the colors have some kind of meaning, I think, as well as differentiating one from the other. So some kids will work with the color. They'll learn that one is a particular color and that the, the five Cuisinier rod is a different color. And they like those colors. They'll think of it in terms of color. But mostly what they're doing is they're thinking of it in terms of this physical analog for addition. So numbers and digits, of course, are based on counting and they're based on you know, enumerating a bunch of things. Now, another way of looking at addition would be to just teach the addition tables and not have a physical analog to it. So we developed for each type of math problem that we put into this product, we developed several different ways that you could look at it and approach a word problem. So the word problem might be approached with a graphic approach, it might be approached with like a geometric approach, and it might be approached with a formulaic approach. And a lot of those came from um, a learning paradigm back then that was called rule example practice. This was used in the ticket system, T-I-C-C-I-T, -I -C -C -I and it was used in some parts of the Plato IV system. But rule example practice basically says some people learn really well if you tell them what the rule is. Some people need practice, and they can start with practice and then infer a rule from it. But those rule-based people don't need it, can't even do the practice until they know what the rule is. So rule Practice and example was the middle one in the thing. So example means if you show some people how to do something, they can infer the rule and they can then practice based on that. Some people have to practice things before, before can, some people can practice even without an example. If you just give them a rule. So, um, so yeah, um, that's, that's what that product was designed to do was to give you the ability to do, to use different approaches and it was so rule-based and so data-based and everything was, was put into a database in fourth. And our programmer in that, Paul Linhart, just worked and worked and worked and worked and worked. The guy was the main programmer. I don't know who else worked on it, but Paul really was kind of saddled with that project. And I think worked on it for the better part of maybe 18 months, maybe even two years. So what were we getting at? The, 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 I mean, the, the company was doing that kind of stuff and that brought in the money that allowed us to then consider. So we would take a portion of that profit, you could say. Um, so 
here's the money coming in. A portion of it is used to create the product, but a portion of it's profit. And as we built that profit, we could add people onto the staff. We could do our own development for our own account, is the way we put it. And that's when we started building FaceMaker, Story Machine. Story Machine, mostly I wrote. FaceMaker was done by a team. Spellicopter was done by a team. Um, and we started doing those things and getting them ready to be our own product. Hmm. Now, we still were not going to be able to siphon off enough money from corporate authoring to do that. So three things came together at pretty much the same time. And I, my recollection is this is near the end of 1982. The three things that came together were... Um, first of all, we had that desire to do it because we wanted to wind up our own toys, send them out in the marketplace. We saw the potential for it and what was going to become of, of, of edutainment software. So we had the motivation to do it and we had the talent to do it. Second thing is the guys from Spinnaker came along. They wanted to release four titles and they, we worked with them so that two of those titles became design work titles, two, two others, um, Oh my goodness, uh, Tom, you probably interviewed the guy, uh, Tom Snyder. Yeah. So, yeah, so Tom Snyder did two of them. And Tom also, uh, you know, formed pretty much a development company, but I don't think went, I don't think he went at all into marketing his own stuff. And the third thing that came together was we decided that because of desire, number one, to publish our own stuff, if we could raise venture capital, then we could go into that. So honestly, what happened was we did the deal with Spinnaker. A lot of the cash that came in initially up front from the Spinnaker deal was again used to boost our creation of additional titles for our own account. And under the contract with Spinnaker, and I don't know how this happened, it, it was interesting. It was almost like today's open source concept in the sense that Spinnaker had the right to publish our stuff, but it was a non-exclusive right. So we couldn't sell it to somebody else, but we could publish it ourselves. So we did do that. In a sense, we were competing with ourselves. In another sense, they, they were real muscle in the marketplace. These guys really understood marketing. And our marketing was good, but they had a really well-designed business plan that put them in that business of being a publisher of other people's things. So to, to put a finer focus on that, Kevin, I wouldn't call us a publisher as much as I would call us a developer publisher. We developed everything except for, I think, one title that we published while I was there. I left in 1986, and uh, the CEO at that time, uh, Jordan Sachs, um, who I'll, I'll say I hired, um, I certainly recommended him, um, it, it got the company a little more into doing additional titles, not being so much a developer because at that point, by 1986, the development had become less critical because there were more outside developers. I guess that's the way to look at it is in 82, if you wanted to be a publisher, you needed a developer. If you were a developer and you had a publisher, then you got royalties but you saw so much more potential and you saw so much more fun. Sure. That's what it was. It was, we wanted to have the fun of doing this. Yeah. So much as, look, I was, I was like 35 years old, 36 years old at the time. Today in the online world being 36, you've probably done two or three startups already. And I had done small things, but this was really the, the first startup that, that anyone knew that I would that anyone knew, comma, that I was also associated with or the founder of. So, um, you know, we, we had, we were at an early point in the development of an industry and there were very few people who could do it all. And I was interested in all those pieces. I was not fluent in all the pieces, but I was interested in absolutely every one. So in 82, late 82 and 83, when we got the venture capital, it was critical. And this, this is where I, you know, kind of when I'm coaching people these days, you know, and this is, this is just common knowledge. If you're a company founder, you want to pay great attention to what you're good at and what you're not good at. And man, when you're not good at something, you want to bring in somebody who is. I was bringing in people who were inexperienced, but were very good in other areas. 
And that was fine as long as it was my own money. When we had venture capital money in there, they insisted, and I agreed, that we needed to have people who had experience in these areas. So we did several different things at that point. One was to bring in Peter Rosenthal, who had, who had been at Atari. Mm -hmm. And that was a, that was a real find uh, for us. Now, it happened because our investors knew Peter. And when one of our investors said to me, hey, we've got this guy who, who we know uh, who would be really good at this, and he's already in the field. And I was kind of, I was, I was having two reactions. One was, oh my God, they think I'm a programmer and I don't know anything about sales and marketing. The other one was, hey, I don't know anything about sales and marketing. <laughs> we're, gonna be, we're gonna be selling our stuff in, computer land was the big chain yeah. in those days. That's where you'd go to buy the computers. And you didn't buy from Apple and from Atari, you, you bought from computer land. I don't know anything about getting stuff into computer land. Um, so this might be good. So when the investor said to me, um, I'll make the connection. And then he said, that was Peter Rosenthal. I had met Peter probably in 79, which was when he was just at Atari. And he had a South, see, I remember all this visually. He had a South facing window with sun coming in. I think it was hot as blazes in his office when I sat there with him first, um, first time we sat there. And, uh, we were talking about marketing and, you know, strategy stuff. And many of my decisions have been based on, like everybody, how, how I perceive the person, how I get along with the person. So I tend to be really energetic when I'm talking about something that I know and I like. I tend to be real quiet when I'm not, which sometimes is okay for a CEO and sometimes not. And Peter fit that same mold. Very, very articulate, very animated about the things that he really has a contribution. And he can be quiet and he can listen. So he was a guy that I liked. And so I said, wow, this is great. How the heck are we going to get him? And that's another story. You've interviewed Peter and I haven't, haven't listened to the entire interview. So you may actually have that story. But we actually did. We did get Peter. Um, we paid a reasonable salary, but he took, took some stock and, um, he also came in and made an investment in the company at the same time. So there's, there's nothing that engenders fear and commitment more than making an investment in a company. <laughs> you know, yeah. at that time I had mortgaged my house and the, uh. the, the mortgage was being used to pay you know, to, to, to fuel the company, my credit cards were all maxed out, all of that stuff. So it was nice to have somebody that number one was competent. Number two, that I got along with well, and number three was like totally committed to it. So that was very cool. And Peter brought in a, a sales guy who knew computer land and knew these other chains and the, the whole distribution scene matured in those days. So between 82 and let's say 86, it went from being, selling software in computer stores where they might have three of your pack, three deep, we'd call it on, on the shelf of, of your product. So they might have three spellicopters there. Or actually, they'd be more like they, they might have like six spellicopters and two math maze. Um, so it went from that to selling in Toys R Us. And with Toys R Us, the model is um, you give them the product, they don't pay for 90 days. And sometimes they wouldn't pay for 180 days. Sometimes they just didn't want to pay. It's basically consignment, which means you give them the product and then sometime later, maybe they'll pay you mm -hmm. if they have the money. Mm -hmm. If the products fly off the shelf and they don't collect anything at the register, then that's our problem, not theirs. So they would call that a return. Uh, much like with Apple, if Apple sells you a computer, you have 14 days to return it. When you return that, it becomes refurbished goods. But for us, we had a package, you know, the size of a book. There was a floppy disk in it, or sometimes two floppy disks, which is more expensive. Floppy disk cost you about 40 or 50 cents to burn and label. And if that flew off the shelf and then came back, you couldn't reuse it. No way to reuse it. Yeah. So even though the disks were read-only, you couldn't write onto them, so you couldn't destroy the program. Um, you know, we would take the loss. Uh, also, if you were going to sell at Toys R Us, you would have to uh, front them some money, pay some money for them to put it on an end cap. 
So for those who are not familiar, the end cap is the, you walk into the store, you see all the aisles there, and the end cap is the front where they have some products sitting there on the end. Mm -hmm. So in the grocery store, you've got maybe some strawberries or you've got some sugar drinks, you know, stuff there. And in Toys R Us, you've got whatever toy is being promoted. So you might have to kick in $50,000 to Toys R Us to have like 10 displays in 10 of their biggest stores. Mm -hmm. What a and racket. <laughs> would sit on that, and if they would sell, you'd get some money, and if they didn't sell, you never got anything for it, and you'd yeah. already sunk your 50K. So Peter and John Smuda, who was the sales guy, understood that stuff, and that was so critical. We would have had zero distribution if I had been doing it, had gotten us into computer land, and then the model changed to Toys R Us. I would have no way to do that. Yeah. So it's just so critical to bring in the people to do that. Yeah. And another thing we did was I learned accounting <laughs> and I learned accounting because initially I wrote a little Apple II program to, to keep our books. And at some point I, we needed to really account for things because we were going to get venture capital and they would require accounting. So I hired a guy named Steve Okasaki and Okasaki san uh, taught me about accounting by getting some software in and working with our books. And of course, interestingly, in the days approaching 84 and 85, Steve was using Peachtree software. And Peachtree software was had been purchased by Management Science America, which then purchased my company in at the end of 1984. So, you know, th those were household or at least business names that you saw, yeah. you saw everywhere. So I, I hope that addresses what the question was. The question, what was that like 20 minutes ago? Yeah, <laughs> I don't remember the question anymore, but it was fascinating. Thank you. Um, speaking of things flying off the shelves, um, I read an old interview with you. Then they had asked you about was piracy a problem in school, and you you blew off the question like, oh, it's it's not a problem. Our stuff's cheap enough that people don't pirate it. And really, I so for, for my true answer to your question is I don't have any evidence one way or another. Okay. Um. There are, you know, th there are many parts of the world where people make statements like that and, as if it's the truth and they really believe it's the truth. So that was a statement of belief in my case. Um, we did put anti-piracy stuff on our discs. So, for instance, uh, what did they do? In those days, the way they did anti-piracy for television signals was they made the sync pulse be really weak mm -hmm. on, a, on a tape. Yeah. Sometimes you'd rent a tape and you'd try to play it and it wouldn't play very well, and that's because the sync pulse was too weak. Sometimes it was because of copy and that didn't copy well. We had two things going for us. One was very few people had two disk drives on the same computer. So to make a copy, you needed to have two disk drives, one to read and one to write, because you couldn't read the whole puppy into memory. Memory was like 48K. You know, yeah, yeah. Hey kids, it's not 48 megabytes. That's not 48 gigabytes that, that we have in our phone here. That's 48 K. So you couldn't read a whole floppy in. And the floppies were, what were they, Kevin? They were, I mean, I remember the tiny, the, the plastic floppies were 1.5 megabytes. Um, but they had five right. and a yeah, yeah, on the, on the, the Atari, they were 90 K and on the Apple, oh, right. they were, they were somewhat more, I think 140. Yeah, so you couldn't read it into memory. There was no way to read it in memory and then eject the disc and then put a new one in and write it. If you were going to do a copy in those days, they had a program which would run you through swapping discs. You must remember doing this at some point. Oh, absolutely. I was a dirty pirate. Yeah. So, so, so copy, the copy disc routine would say, put in disc one and then it would say, eject disc one, put in disc two, sure. eject disc two. And what the Atari disk drives were kind of like a toaster. There was a, a latch of some sort on it that yeah. would latch the thing closed. And sometimes you'd get it right and sometimes you wouldn't get it right. And sometimes the disk wouldn't be aligned just right and you, you know, you'd have some problem. There's a spindle. It's just like a record player in the sense there was a spindle that would center the thing. Um, so was it a real problem? We put anti-piracy stuff on the disks of various sorts. Things like um, there was a sector that was readable by the operating system, but not writable. I'll, I'll call it sector zero. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we could put a code into sector zero that our program would look for. And if it saw it, it would run. And if it didn't see it, it would just not run. Or it would call the person a dirty pirate. 
I don't know what it did. Maybe it went, right. And um, so we did a lot of that stuff. But I don't know how effective it was. I, I think it was effective against casual pirates. I think against somebody in a computer lab, probably not. But, you know, we kept thinking that the personal computer would really take over and be in homes everywhere. And it took a long time for that to happen. Yeah. So there were computer labs in schools. We were hoping they would get to, you know, the labs would have like 20 computers or so. Uh, people were seeding that. Apple bought 20,000 copies of our computer discovery title from SRA. They had negotiated that deal. We didn't know it. It was very cool. If I had negotiated that deal, I wouldn't have needed SRA's money. I could have <laughs> kept, a, kept the whole thing. But this is why you partner with these guys. They do the things that you can't do or you don't know to do. Uh, they sold 20,000 copies of computer discovery. So that's one per kid. So 20,000 kids got computer discovery in classroom sets that Apple gave to schools when they bought Apple computers. They had to reprint. They went to second and third printings of the book. I think we revised it once. Um, you know, it was fantastic what was happening to it. It was mostly going into schools. Mm -hmm. If we'd been going into homes, I think piracy would have been a bigger factor. Uh, but it, it was not so much going into schools. And, you know, when, when did computers really go into people's homes? I'm going to say there were a lot of IBM PCs, but, of course, that was business-oriented. That was their whole sure. thing, called international business machines for a reason. And so the IBM PC was going into homes and was running Windows, you know, more than anything. Um, our programs, what did our programs do? I think our programs actually took over the whole machine. Back in those days, you didn't really have an operating system. Right, yeah. Just in yeah. Apple, you, you didn't have, have basic, but there wasn't a real operating system. It was kind of like being root on a Linux machine. <laughs> you know, command lines right, right. was below the scenes. So, um, okay. so, so anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm far afield on this. Sorry. It's all right. Um, so you, you said you program story machine yourself. Yes. Um, I just want to, we've talked a lot about businessy stuff and, and uh, just, I don't know, you talked about the, the specialized fourth language you use. Can you tell me a little something about programming story machine? How was it a challenge uh, where you running up against you know, memory issues, uh, was it, was it designed ahead of time or were you kind of winging it play testing? I don't just tell me about the creation. Yeah. The, the two that are the most interesting in that string of possible questions there is, was it planned ahead of time or were we winging it? Yes to both. So just, just like we do agile programming or any variant of agile these days, we were doing agile back then. So I brainstormed with the crew. Honestly, in the brainstorming, I think people didn't understand kind of what I was thinking behind the scenes. They couldn't figure out how it was going to work. But Story Machine, the title means we've got this machine, this piece of software, into which you can type a story and it will make it, it'll animate it for you. So I don't remember all the characters in it, but we there was a boy and a girl there was a dog. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if there was a ball. We had a ball in computer discoveries. There may have been a ball. I think there was there was a tree. Um, and then we designed a whole bunch of, so those were the nouns. Those were the objects. You think of it as, as being like a sentence. So you got boy and girl and dog, tree. And we designed verbs for them. So the verbs for those objects would be walk, jump. We may have had something like sit. Is actually became a verb. Um, run. And I said jump. So in other words, eats because the dog could eat the tree. And I know that. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, I forgot that one. But see, see, so that's an example. I mean, eating is something that you do, but we made sure that, that you could do in some kind of comedic way, all of the things. So let's go on your memory. If we had eat in there, the one I remember most is jumps, but let's say we had eat. 
So the expect the thing you would expect is if there was food there, the dog would the dog eats the food would be some kind of reasonable thing, and you see the dog go chomp 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 like that, right? But if you have a tree, then what's it like for the tree to eat the food? So we thought of all of those, and we thought of what kind of comedic animation we could put into the program for every possible verb like that. So, so you have verbs like the dog runs. So that's easy. The dog runs. I think the dog ran a, a, out and back or something like that. And the dog could be anywhere on the screen. And, and, and if you say the dog runs, he would run. So the dog runs is really easy. But the dog runs to the tree is another thing. So then you've got to have a tree. And what we do is the dog would appear, the tree would appear, and then the dog would run to the tree. I don't know that. I don't think the dog ran back. I think the dog did something else at the tree when it Got that. Actually, we were not that raunchy. The dog didn't do anything to the tree. <laughs> but I, I remember one verb really well because I just thought it was hilarious and it was kind of an Easter egg. It was the verb jump, jumps. So you could say the boy jumps and the boy would appear and he would jump up and down. But you could also write a grammatical sentence, the boy jumps the dog. Now, what's that mean? I mean, jump is kind of like he jumps out of the back alley and accosts the dog, right? We didn't do that. So the boy would appear and the dog would appear and the boy jumps the dog. The dog would jump. I think the boy turned to him and then the dog would jump and then the boy would turn back. So, so, something of that sort. But, you know, we, we took a kind of an offbeat view of the verb jump. <laughs> so, um, again, if we had eats in there, then the boy eats the tree would do something and, you know, I can imagine right now how I would program that, but honestly, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> so, the, so the idea was to have these verbs, to have a kind of parser, because you would type it in. So you'd have to type the boy runs, period, and then push the enter key or the return key and, and have that animated for you, have the things appear and then have it animated for you. So you could write little tiny stories of that sort. Um, and that parsing was something that I knew really well because it had come from my computer science background. The, the then taking the fully parsed sentence, so we would determine that the sentence was grammatically correct. We could determine what the, I'm going to call it the deep meaning, but in, in, in Chomsky terms, it would be the deep structure of the sentence. So what does the sentence actually mean? What's the nugget of meaning in the thing? The boy runs the dog. It means there's a boy. It means there's a dog. It means the boy is running the dog somewhere. Right? They're running together. So we got that deep structure, and there was a certain set of them. This same thing appeared later on, just incidentally. Um, we did a look at some technology that Ask.com was, was building. This was in 1999, and I think it was in 1999. So Ask was, is, was a search engine where you would type in a natural language inquiry. And the technologists at ASK had that same view of the world that I had, which was, if we get a sentence as our input, we'll look at what the actual deep meaning of that sentence is, and then try to map the deep meaning of the, the inquiry to the deep meanings of results. So unlike, so with Google, for instance, you're pretty sure when you type in Google that you're, if you type in three words like save the whale, you're going to get pages that have save and whale on them, right? Um, but you're not likely to get pages for saving marine mammals of other sorts sure. that are not that don't have the word whale on the page. But ask.com would do that kind of, I'm going to call it inference. It wasn't really inference. It was mapping your question to a deep structure, and they had, I'm going to say, like a thousand different frameworks of that sort that they could then map to, to search results. So we were doing that in this infinitesimally small way on the 6502. Were we to do that again today, we would do this and we would have thousands of verbs. You know, we'd have lots of fun interactions and we would have the ability for people to build their own verbs and objects and build those into the system. That's the way we'd look at it today with greater computing capacity. Uh, but back then, every one of those products had something you could do. With Spellicopter, you could load in word lists, but 
and I'm pretty sure of this, but certainly with later products, you could build your own lists and save them. That was a key component of everything we did, uh, at least when we were publishing under our own name. Hmm. Was, you know, build buildability, building blocks. Give them building blocks so they can at least put in some other content. And again, these days, we'd not only want to put content in, we would want them to be able to design interaction as well. Okay, so things are humming along. You're publishing your own stuff. And then uh, eventually... What changed you? I know you're acquired by by Peachtree. What brought that along? Yeah, so so what really changed there was um, was what I was describing. So I was describing the tip of the iceberg. You're selling to Toys R Us. You're selling to big chains, and you're fronting a lot of money. You you're going to make a hundred thousand dollar sale, let's say, to Toys R Us. And that number is just for discussion. I I don't. I'm sure we had sales that were. Um, of that order, probably not much larger, but l let's say you're making a hundred thousand dollar sale and you think you're going to get your money in 90 days or you're going to get some money up front. And we probably did. We probably got some payment and then we were to get contractually to get more money at 90 days. And now they start stretching you. Um, I can say Toys R Us because I, mean, I know they were stretching and everyone knew that they were stretching and, and most of these firms were and especially the new ones. The new distributors would do that a lot. I won't mention distributors right now. We had really big distributors who were really good. Well, I'll mention good ones. So Softcat, K-A-T. Um, Softcat was, was, was a huge educational distributor. Uh, st started by some guys named Katz, <laughs> K-A-T-Z, and um, uh, just great guys, very interesting, loved the company, liked working with them, and they paid us on the terms that we were supposed to get. The big retail guys were used to not paying on terms and, and, and did not do it. So you had a $100,000 order out there. You spent, and this is typical, so your manufacturing costs are gonna, so the 100,000 is what we charge them. On the shelf, that would be $200,000 worth of money coming in, which you kind of split. Uh, normally, the distributor would buy at 40% uh, of our price, sell to a retailer at 60% of retail price, and then it would sell at 100% of retail price or discounted. And as the discounts started getting ferocious, that would eat into the store's margin, it would eat into the distributor's margin, and eventually they would put pressure on us to reduce our base price. So in our base price, which was the money we got was 40% of retail. So let's say it was selling for $20. And, and that was, you know, we were selling for $39, then we were selling for 29, then it was $24.99. A lot of our stuff I think sold at $19.99. There may have been some real blowouts lower than that, probably not lower than $14.99. So we're getting 40% of that. And our manufacturing cost for the disc, the box, and everything, the manufacturing cost alone would be about 20% of the retail price. So a $20 in the store product would cost us $4 to manufacture. But as they began squeezing us, because things were so competitive and we needed to be price competitive, as they began squeezing us, we'd get closer and closer and closer to what it cost us to make it. And that's just writing off the development money altogether. So when I say that a product cost us $4 to build and ship out the door and we were getting $8 for it, that, that $4 margin there had to pay for everything else, pay for all the development, had to pay for our advertising. So when we were placing ads, which is another great story that's in, in my blog articles and I won't go into, but when we were placing the ads, that money would go out and we were not selling direct, so we couldn't tell what the real result was mm -hmm. of all of that advertising. And that's a nail biter for everybody. It's like that thing about you're, you're wasting half of your ad dollars, but you don't know which half, right? <laughs> yeah, that's, yes, it's a good way of putting it. But, you know, here we had Peter buying ads for us. And I, I think he would say, again, I haven't listed, listened to his podcast. I think it'd be instructive for people to listen to it and, and compare and see what we're finding. Um, I mean, I know he pointed out that there's always 
a bit of head butting between marketing and salespeople and development people. And I saw that from, you know, from all angles. And also we tried to absolutely minimize that at design work. We had our development people go to trade shows and work the floor uh, and talk to potential buyers and learn what they were looking for, as well as doing as learning what kids and, and uh, teachers wanted in the schools. So, um, yeah, so, so you're getting squeezed on all that stuff and your cash is tied up and then you get Toys R Us at 90 days. So at 90 days, I would say to Steve, call them up and give them a reminder that they're going to have to pay because they wouldn't pay unless you reminded them. They had a computer system that was telling them there was $100,000 due. Sure. But they're not going to pay it. I mean, they're managing their money really tightly. And the terms, the 90 day terms, are, I think they kind of view it as a guideline. I don't think they were being bad about it. I don't think they were being nasty. I think it was a necessity in the high flying environment that they were working in. Um, it's unfortunate because you know, you'd like to be honorable about signing, signing a contract and honoring the terms, but I thought they would honor the terms and I was wrong. And we were in a market that was really very difficult. Uh, people would have liked to pay us, but they couldn't. So the 90 days, they would ask us for a 10 day extension. I would use the line of credit at our bank. <laughs> we would keep developing, we'd keep advertising. We'd get some money in from another customer and it would work. Maybe we could get Toys R Us to give us a $5,000 check. Um, and I think with them, we at least once ran out to 180 days or more. 180 days is half a year. How do you bankroll 12 developers and 12 additional people? Because we had 24, 25, 30 people maybe at that point. How do you bankroll them? Yeah. It's tough. And how then do you also develop new titles? And that's, see, that's the problem that we see in so many companies nowadays. So, so this is typical for a company founder to think this way. I've got a startup. I put together some R and D. A lot of it is my personal knowledge, so that's cheap. I mean, it's very expensive for me, but I don't have to. I pay myself a dollar a year, <laughs> live on beans. We'll develop a product. We'll get some marketing people. It'll sell. So you get out there, you get some initial sales. A lot of sales. As CEO, a lot of the sales are sales you personally make. So 80, 80, 1980, 1981, 1982, I made the sales because I was selling to the big publishers. And I, I was in New York twice a month from San Francisco. I knew the flight crews on American Airlines on particular flights by name. Um, and I'd say, yeah, going to New York. I'll be back tomorrow night. <laughs> you know, and I'd see them on the return flight. By, 82, by 83, Peter and John were doing the selling. I was not doing the selling. So, again, nail biter, to use that term. And... As the market got more intense and the cash flow got more difficult, I could put more and more money in, but I was not independently wealthy or even wealthy at that time and had, say, around $150,000 mortgage on my house, um, all of which had gone into the company by 1984, and I just needed investors. So... Could I have found some individuals who would invest? Yeah, probably. But venture capital was really big. Sure. So there, there, there was this Forbes article that we were one of three companies that we were, were featured in called uh, Software to Go. I think the article, oh gosh, I think it was in 83. I should have looked at that because I, I, I blogged about it two days ago. But um, the article was about this high-flying world of programmers. They had a funny little sketch on, on the um, cover of the magazine of a guy, I think he had he, like a three day, three day growth on his face. He looked really disheveled and, you know, kind of a junky place with the personal computers and all of that. Like he was, they referred to it as a cottage industry. And yeah, I would say in 78 and 79 authoring for personal computers was a cottage industry by 82, 83 and 84, we had brought it into more of the industrial and the software mold. It was, 
it wasn't the cottage industry at that point. You know, we met through a million dollars a year in annual sales. We were approaching two when, when I left. And that's, that's compared to Xerox and Apple, that's chump change and it's cottage industry. But compared to my working here, I and mean, right now I work in, in my studio, which is one of the floors in our house. Um, and it's a music studio now because I'm a composer rather than a, a software guy. Um, so yeah, I could start a cottage industry and, and, you know, when I started design work, it was started at a desk in the back spare bedroom in my flat in San Francisco, the flat probably was 1200 square feet, 200 of which were devoted to that office. My kids used to come in and want to pound on the Apple too. Sure. That's a cottage industry. So we'd gone beyond cottage industry to being, you know, a real thing. And there were more developers. And, you know, we were ready to move into it. But there was kind of a bust in those days in 86, 87. And all these factors that I've described, like the cash flow problem and distribution, getting into distribution became almost impossible unless you were already in distribution. So Spinnaker, Davidson, started by Jan Davidson, uh, Learning Company. Learning Company had not been acquired by Bruderbund, I think, at that point. Bruderbund's another great example of this. All these companies that were in distribution could tug on the heartstrings of the distributor and say, I've got a new title, will you take it? They would always take it and they would always put one or two copies in per store. But a new company coming along couldn't get even the one or two copies in there. Hmm. So we had something valuable. We had a backlist, which is what publishers call it when they've got all those titles there. We had new titles coming out. We had Grammar Examiner, Mission Algebra, a bunch of things. And we looked good, and the only thing we didn't have was the huge growth that we were projecting. Although, first year in business, we did, again, this magical number, about $140,000 in business. And by the time we went for venture capital, we were somewhere between a half million and a million in revenues. Uh, and... By the time I left, we were like 10 times bigger than we had been when I started it. So growing 10x in about five years was was pretty good. Yeah. In those days. I mean, today you might grow 100x if you were really spectacularly successful and otherwise not. But, you know, very few companies have 10 or 20 percent compounded annual growth rates. That's that's just really tough. And the place where you do have those kind of growth rates is when you're filling channels. So let's talk about channel filling. So we were selling to a distributor who sold to a store, who sold to, to a customer. Those are called channels. And channel filling, I, again, I don't know how, what your listeners know about this, but channel filling is this phenomenon where the developer makes the product, sells it to the distributor. That's a channel. We're filling that channel with product. So it starts with none, none at the distributor. And we sell them this much. And we sell them a little more. Sell them a little more. They've got to sell that to the next person up. So they want their inventory to start going down. But we want to sell more. So there's a real science and art to mastering the, the channel, the distribution channels. Mm -hmm. And ideally, what you want is you want lots of sales, but you also want them rushing out the door to the customer. And we had filled the channels really nicely. But the turnover in the channel, so it, let's say we had 100 copies of a title at SoftCat, um, you know, they might have been turning 30 of those in a month. And so it would take them like three months to work down our sale of 100 items. And we wanted those 100 items to go every month. So the first month we sold 100, the next month we sold zero. Right. And then maybe we sold 30, and then maybe we sold 30 or so. So that was our continuing channel sales that we could, we could count on. That wasn't what the earlier figures were leading us to project. If you did a straight line projection, you'd think we were going up, but they weren't. So you, you ramp up, you ramp up, you ramp up. Once your channel is filled, then you've got a challenge and you, you kind of slow down. Then it's got to be all the consumer drawing things out of the channel. Hmm. An interesting, interesting kind of side item here is I'm, I'm, a, I'm a geeky guy and a CEO and I like talking to people and a computer scientist. And so I started this company as computer scientist, but I started it because I love starting things and I love building things. So I was the founder, 80% um, shareholder, 
CEO, president of the company. We got venture capital and I was able to retain, I think at that point I still owned 60 or 65% of the company because of the valuation we, we put on that. So I personally still own 60 or 65%. I retained the CEO and president positions, even though we knew we needed to bring in really strong people. And that was kind of the bargain. So the bargain was if I brought in really strong, experienced people at the VP level, then the investors would be fine with me being there because there would be kind of a check on, you know, on what I was doing. And I know there were thoughts in their heads that, um, you know, if I decided I wanted to go back to development, then Peter or somebody could take over as CEO. Um, be interesting to ask Peter how he felt about that. My guess is knowing him all these years that he would be as hesitant about taking on the CEO position as anything. It, it's, um, you know, it's one of those things where if I had people, if I had VPs working for me who were really ambitious and wanted to run the company, it would have been different. But instead the hiring profile that I had was collaborative, cooperative, listen before you speak, you know, all of these kinds of things that we'd really like in our managers. <laughs> My God, you know, I mean, yeah, who yeah. wants to work with somebody that's always mouthing off and always ambitious and always putting other people down? I've run into those. I don't want them working for me. And I'm not going to be that way. And I really, really don't want them to be. So I retained the position of uh, chairman of the board, CEO, president. All the way through that, that first acquisition by MSA, uh, I think that my title became general manager. It effectively was CEO. Peachtree was going to take over our manufacturing. Uh, I don't know that they ever did because of the shortness of time that we were with MSA. And then the sale to Encyclopedia Britannica. And when we sold the Peachtree companies, so that's Designwear, Edgeware, and Blue Chip, but not Peachtree itself, when we, I say we, because Denny Bowes was the executive vice president of MSA. This is a lot of acronyms. Denny and I did the sale. Denny engineered who we would talk to, and then I went and really sold these three companies. And Britannica got three companies for the price of one. So at that point, markets and distribution and everything were so clogged and not collapsed, really. I, I'm tempted to use that word. So stagnated. Um, no, not, stagnated is not the right word. Things were moving, just not at the level that we wanted them to move. Um, that really the three companies were doing as much business as Designwear had been doing. So, we, you know, we sold those three. And Stan Frank, Dr. Stanley Frank, who had been group vice president at CBS for publishing. I want to call the group uh, the CBS Educational and Professional Publishing. So I, I think that was the official name. Um, Stan uh, had gone from being group vice president at CBS to being an executive vice president at Encyclopedia Britannica. Now, what does Encyclopedia Britannica know about software? Well, honestly, nothing, right? Yeah. It's a 400-year-old institution at that point. Very, you know, leather-bound encyclopedia sets and hardcore sales, like guys pounding the pavement you know, selling to little old ladies who dare to open the door and the guy gets his foot in the door and then sells her an encyclopedia for a thousand dollars. That was the image and that in they had signed a class action settlement that prohibited them from doing that anymore. So here's Stan going to Britannica and starting a new thing. They called it um, Britannica Learning Corporation and it was intended to be a group within Britannica. They bought um, a bunch of, of uh, preschools, not preschools, uh, it's called, it was called American learning. It was like Kaplan now does. So they have had storefronts mm -hmm. and kids would come there after school and study and learn things. So they bought American learning that had about a hundred outlets and they bought us. And this is where what you do in the past comes to roost in the future. So I'll tell this story in included if you have time or not. Um, Stan looked at our companies and then went back to the to Britannica and basically recommended against buying the companies. And it turns out that when we had sold our product to Reader's Digest, the person that we sold it to at Reader's Digest was Sheila Frank. You'll notice a common family name there. And 
That's how we came to the attention of Stanley Frank and Encyclopedia Britannica. We had done a product which had cost us lots more than we had taken in from the, from the publisher. It had never been published. We later on were acquired by Britannica uh, because of that connection. So I always, again, I point out to young people or people that I'm coaching, as I point out, we're on a carousel here. What we do one year can come back five years later to either bite us or make us, make us happy, <laughs> okay? Can come back 10, 20, or 30 years later. It can come back in a completely different field even. It doesn't have to be the same kind of endeavor. So it's, you know, it's just so important to have good relationships with people, do things and do things in an honorable way. Uh, you know, complete the things that you say you're going to complete. And when you can't, uh, to be straight up about it. So that's another thing to develop, you know. Our developers, and this is the developer marketing thing, is in marketing, we always want more capabilities. We want glitzy stuff. The developers tend to say, oh, yeah, I can do that, you know. I can do that. It's a very common kind of thing to say. So your developer is always going to want to please you by saying that he or she can do everything that you want before they've even sat down to analyze it. It is entirely crucial that developers be really, really upfront with what they think they can do. And in fact, my rule was figure out how long you think it's going to take and double or triple it. And your customer is going to say, that's terrible. We can't possibly afford doing that. And you know what? You're going to be right. It is going to take two times or sometimes three times what it thought you. Because unless you do a real detailed analysis, you're, this is a, you know, a wing and a prayer is, is the term. Um, with a thorough analysis, you can do better. So we ended up being pretty good. We were, um, on, a, on our estimates for publishers, I prided myself on the fact that we were within 10% of every projected development budget and timeline uh, that we did. Well, and we did that by being very precise about how we projected things. We would go down to, oh, this is this subroutine is going to take a half day, and this one's going to take a half day, and that one's going to take two days to do. We would do a lot of that kind of analysis before we'd even make a bid. And the reason we could do that was as CEO and as sales guy, I knew when somebody was being overly optimistic. If I had had only a sales background, that would have been tough. So I'm a great fan of this kind of integration. Um, you know, if, if I could, I would want all of my salespeople to learn something about programming. Uh, they'd be frustrated. And guess what? That's what happens to the programmers. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's no such thing as a bug that helps you and makes things faster. All bugs slow you down. So, um, you know, every once in a while you might have something that saves you a half day of work, but more than more often than not, you're going to have something that costs you a day or two days or a week. Uh. Absolutely random question. You mentioned advertising earlier, and you made me think of the the, the ads uh, that that I saw for for Designwear in the magazines back in the day. And there were these children in the ads. There was a little girl sitting on a dictionary, looking just like super smug. And I'm wondering if if those were models or were those are you know kids of of employees or or where those children came from. The I don't have the detail to be able to answer that. Um, we hired a uh, young agency called Patterson and Glenn, and Doug Glenn became uh, uh, a friend of mine for quite a few years. I haven't talked to him in quite a while now, uh, and later went on to be a marketing uh, guy at uh, LucasArts Entertainment. And Doug located the kids. They were local kids. They were look, uh, They were given a chance to try the programs, although, yeah, so in, in those days, the, the programs would have been working. So we did have them do it. And they were assigned to modeling contracts. Now, I don't know whether they were signed after they were chosen or whether that was a requirement. So I, I can't give you a de definitive answer. 
Fair enough. The underlying question in what you're asking is, did we actually take kids off, off the street or out of the classroom who, who had used our stuff and used them? No, we did not do that. And today that would be a cool way to do it because that's the equivalent of social media, you know, in the, in the sense that you're, you're working with your customer. Um, yes, we would have done that um, if, if we had been like 10 or 10 years later. Sure. <laughs> All right. So uh, what haven't I asked you about those days that I should have sort of talked oh, about? Yeah, I, I, I feel like I'm slighting the Atari side of it. And part of the reason is, you know, that that was a component in our whole mix of things. And, you know, I hope I've said enough that I loved the Atari stuff and it was just really fun doing it. And today's um, gamer or use of any user of any personal computer, I think would just be astounded at, you know, how tiny the capabilities were uh, of these machines. And, and probably also just, just, you know, it interests me how many things we're doing now that we projected in the 60s and 70s. So, you know, that's like almost 50 years ago, you know. So 50 years ago, we were thinking about people going down to a co-working. So I was projecting that people would be at home, get up in the morning, have a coffee, maybe not have a coffee at home, go down to a corner co-working space, drop the kids in a side room where they'd have childcare, and sit down at a computer terminal and hook up to, by, by a leased line, we would call it in those days, so it's our equivalent of broadband, um, to a supercomputer somewhere and do their work. And 11 o'clock, they'd stop and have a coffee with friends, and, you know, the, the people would be working that way. We're doing that today. So many of us work from home. Uh, almost everything I do right now in, in the technical arena, I do from here. I do a lot of video conferences, just like we're doing here. Um, Video conferencing is, is, is my staple right now. I will meet with the client when I'm first working with them. And I, just as an example, we have a client that we did a website for a year and a half ago. It's just a small, another guy and I in, in our development group. Um, year and a half ago, and we met with them, I think twice back then, and we haven't met with them face to face since. So we met with them initially to do the sale, and then we met afterward uh, to do some stuff and meet the people. But man, once you know the people, then video works really well. Sure. And many people work without you know, ever actually physically uh, shaking hands. So that's very interesting to look back at that stuff and realize how much of it we envisioned, how much of it we actually did. Because we, you know, we did things with dial-up modems in 1972 and 73, and they were like way slow. But they were... They were in anticipation. They were the same kind of work I do today. Same kind of work. Mm -hmm. So if I'm writing a blog article today, I'm interacting through the web with WordPress uh, to write that article. But back then, I would be interacting via a dial-up modem with a word processor on the mainframe. And then eventually I'd have that thing printed and it would go camera ready and we'd you know, reproduce it for a newsletter or something. Mm -hmm. Same kind of process same kind of remote communication, the locus of where the computing is done has changed. Sure. Well, let's talk about what you do today. You said you're a composer, and I was on SoundCloud listening to some of your work, which is amazing. Um, is that your main thing now, composing? or? Mostly. It's probably 75% of what I do, 25%. I still do some work in security, uh, have a project uh, that helps uh, monitor the online health of free speech and human rights organizations. So, uh, Committee to Protect Journalists, Reporters Without Borders, all of those, those kind of sites are under attack all the time. And I have a project which monitors those sites, determines how effective the attack is, so these are mostly denial of service attacks, and then we graph things and, uh, and alert the responsible person in each case when they're under attack. Cool. Um, so I've done that quite a bit, and I, I spent some time on that. And then uh, my company, Red7, uh, which is at red7.com, has been, we do projects, development projects for people, 
Um, we're not soliciting any new businesses now, and that's going to stay at a fairly low level. So, yeah, it's about three quarters of my time is on the composition. So two years ago, 2015, I applied for a new program in technology and applied composition is what it's called. So TAC, T-A-C, at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. Uh, I applied for it at age 69 and auditioned and everything, and I got in. I was really happy about that. Uh, so I got into a one-year program. They have a four-year program for undergrads. So it's like high school kids that, that are ready to go to college and get a bachelor's degree. But they also have this program for about a half dozen, mostly professionals in the field. So these are people who are composers or musicians and want to learn the technology and the software. I've been writing with software for years and years and years. So I've used Finale and Digital Performer and Cakewalk and all these things that are programs that ran on microcomputers um, and then ran on Macintoshes in the 19, I'm going to say late in the 1980s. I worked with those, but boy, they were miserable to work with, just miserable. It was too much like programming and not enough like writing music. Today's programs are fantastic. So Pro Tools and Cubase and uh, Logic Pro particularly, which I use, uh, as of like maybe five years ago, those really caught up with what we would like to see music. music uh, we call them di digital audio workspaces. So they're, they're workspaces in which you can compose using MIDI and MIDI instruments or uh, samples. And by samples, I mean whole orchestras of just the individual notes played forcefully, softly, sustained, staccato short, pizzicatos, you know, on a, on a stringed instrument, you can pluck the string. Um, so I have an orchestra of hundreds and hundreds of instruments in this computer that I'm talking to you through and in my MacBook Pro over there that I carry around with me and I can make that orchestra do what I want to do. I can write on a staff, like regular music notation, or I can write it a little bit more programmatically. And so two years ago, I went through this one year program studying that and have been really, it really helped me ramp up my compositional ability. And what I write is kind of melodic, harmonic, chromatic stuff. It's not far out, you know, wild modern music. And that's fine. It's, it's, it's just what I like to do. And it's not poppy at all. Um, a lot of people in the program really do stuff that's, that's more pop or even uh, EDM. Um, I haven't been interested in it. So it's been fantastic for me. And I'm starting a project there now to help composers collaborate with choreographers. So just getting that started, we're going to award, we're going to make an award to a student uh, in another month. And we're um, putting together relationships with local San Francisco dance companies that are na nationally and, and world renowned. So we'll have something on that, on that going, uh, I'm going to say within, within six months. So yeah, it's a change, but look, it's still the same kind of thing. I'm still using computers to do it. It's still complexity. It's still engineering. Uh, I, I, I have a, a t-shirt that I made for, uh, for myself. That's, it, it's it's like an like an athletics kind of shirt, and it's the San Francisco Conservatory of Music Department of Design and Engineering. So in a music conservatory, you know what's design and engineering? Well, when you think about it, composition is the design and engineering, isn't it? So so that's how I view it. Is is I'm taking a core capability that I've had all along and an interest in music and turning that into something new. I highly recommend that for people that have been through a career and want to do something else. Uh, you know, take something you're strong at, find a new way to apply it, and you'll come up the curve much faster. A lot of people like to start like really fresh and completely new, but I think it's just so effective if you can start something that's new for you, but uses a capability where you're already at the professional level. Very good. I, I saw in your blog that uh, uh, in June you were starting cello and I see it back there behind yeah. you. Uh, which <laughs> I was curious how I today uh, in in an hour I'm having my second cello lesson um, so I play piano and I thought oh, I'll try cello for a month They're just gonna just like me yeah so uh, how's it how's it going what what am I in for <laughs> you know well for anyone who's used to used a stringed instrument like that 
I, you know, I'm still playing only in the first position. So, so basically I kind of almost, I figuratively glue my thumb to the back of, of the instrument. And then there are four strings on the cello. So you can go back and forth like this and I can bow it and I can pluck pizzicato and I can play the first 10 exercises in the book that I'm learning from. Uh, I have a teacher that I've taken, I think, four lessons from. I'm now about three months in on this. At the end of the fourth lesson, I said, um, look, I know that at the fifth lesson, which we're thinking of scheduling, you're just going to be on me about keep it in this position, hold the bow properly. Because for bowing on a cello, the you can think of it as arcing, right? because the four strings are in an arc over the top of the, the, the instrument. Mm -hmm. And when you put the bow at a particular angle, it hits one of the strings. So like at the lowest angle, it'll hit the C string and there's G and D and A. So you have to move it up and you have to only hit the one string. If you want to hit one note, if you hit two strings, you get two notes, you get a spurious note. So I knew at the end of the fourth lesson that I just needed to work and work and work and work on that. So my, my wife and other people are involved in meditation and in meditation, they say you don't get good until you've done it for 10,000 hours. Uh, you may know that a thousand hours is about a half of a work year. So about 2000 work hours in a year, if you're doing 40 hours a week. So my goal is to try to get to about a thousand hours of practice with a few lessons and then just see what I sound like. Mostly, mostly what I wanted to do as a composer was understand the kind of torture that I was applying to the cellist, okay? I mean, to all the stringed instruments. Sure. Let's, let's say the, bow, the bowed stringed instruments. So, you know, we, we've got, got um, uh, violin, cello, uh, violin, viola, cello, and, and string bass. So let's take those four. I wanted to know what I was causing them to do that was troublesome for them. So it was very important for me to learn it. It is important for me to learn it at least that well. I don't think I'll be able to record anything really good for my own pieces. I will continue now to use the cello to understand what key I might want to put it in, what kind of notes I may want to, to slur or not slur. Um, you, we don't need to go into all of that. Uh, but it really does help me understand what I'm asking the player to do. And a lot of composers do this, but not as many as you might think. Most composers are good on an instrument. And sometimes they're good on an instrument and then good on the keyboard. Almost all composers are pretty good on the keyboard, you know, because visual, visually when I'm composing, I always – visualize the keyboard. I don't visualize the staff on the paper. And a, a lot of composers that I know can like just do it on the staff and can kind of hear, they go from visual to hearing pretty easily. That's tough for me. For me, I can hear it if I visualize it on a keyboard. Mm -hmm. And that's from I don't know, 15 years of uh, classical piano training when I was, sure. you know, from age five to age 20. Uh, I was practicing one or two hours every day. And when I was 20 and thinking about going into it as a career, I was practicing 10 hours a day hmm. Wow! For a, for a particular stretch of two or three months. Uh, one summer, I decided to really try it and see whether I liked that amount of work. And that is, in fact, the amount of work that a pianist puts in. They put in at least a business day. And every once in a while they have a day off or they're traveling or something, but man, they're practice, 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 practice. So, so that's why I did it. Le learning cello in order to know what the, the, the instrumentalists have to go through when you compose seems awfully similar to a marketer learning programming. <laughs> I knew, yes, I knew you were going to say that. that, that was, I, if you didn't, I would have done the same metaphor. Absolutely. And it's equivalent to the programmer understanding marketing. It's, it's just so important to have some bit of immersion uh, to, to, to understand you know, what's going on there. It, it, it's like we tell people in a conflict situation to try to put themselves in the other person's shoes. And that's what this is, except that in music and in programming, 
putting yourself in the other person's shoes isn't that easy. You know, it's not like you just stick your foot in the shoe. Sure. All right. Well, yes, I absolutely in, encourage that kind of behavior whenever I can. Nice. All right, I think this will be my last question. Uh, if you could send a message to the kids who grew up using your software and now they're adults listening to this podcast, what would you tell them? I, I think, first of all, that if they even remember that they used Designware, that's interesting. And, and they should really think about why they remember it. I'm not going to try to put a thought in their head that they remembered it because it was great entertainment or great education or it because, because the software was a big crock. Okay. doesn't matter. What matters is what they, what they do with that. So if it somehow entered into their lives and changed something, that's great. Hope it didn't change it for the worse, but, but it may have. And all those changes are a part of the life of the planet. So as, as the guy who created the company, along with a whole bunch of other people that worked with me, um, I recognized that in this world of billions of people, there are all these threads going on all the time. And two threads can, can get together and kind of bounce off each other and go off in different directions, and it can have a huge effect. Um, people sometimes refer to that as the butterfly effect. The butterfly flapping its wings may cause some air to change its direction, causing a huge storm in the Caribbean you know, a month later. Um, and the fact that they remember the design or software is one of those butterfly effect kind of things. And I just think it'd be fun. Hopefully it's fun for them, but fun for me to, to just, you know, just hear when that's happened, like the story of this guy who said that he fought with his brother. Never would have expected that. And it had interesting side effects. And, and of course, one can go to Internet Archive now and play the games. So it, yeah. it's it's really interesting. You know, it's interesting to do, and it takes one back down, down memory lane. Absolutely. So, so the sentence is just, remember the butterfly effect, end quote. Excellent. I have what I need. Thank you so much. You're quite welcome. It's, it's very cool that you're doing this. It definitely triggered a whole day of writing on my part. And, sorry, you know, not sorry. <laughs> a, a lot of reminiscing, but but it's it's important, I think, to understand roots. You know where we came from, what we did, and how that's influenced what we are today. Sometimes it helps you, you know, bounce even higher today. Great. So it's been fun.